Welcome to the Pentier Training Institute. Uh, today we'll be talking Electrical 101. Uh, first and foremost, before we really get into this, I want to make sure you understand, uh, by no means do I want you to become an electrician. Um, more importantly, what this discussion is about is understanding some basic electrical principles, and more importantly, to learn the vocabulary. So when you're working with an electrician, you kind of know what you're saying. First and foremost, always check your license and understand the categories that the licenses can be applied to. For example, CAT2. And I'll explain this a little bit later, but uh, real briefly, most of our well drillers and installers are only CAT2, which means you only go to the pump control. Please don't violate your license, and please don't be afraid to ask for help when you need it. Uh, right now, we're going to go over uh, a few little laundry items, so to speak. Uh, one thing I want to talk about is the Pentair Learning Center uh, that is out there on the web. If you go to our website, stayright.com, or berkeleypumps.com under the resource tab you'll see learning opportunities it'll highlight not just the Pentair Learning Center but also the webinars and also live schools uh, the PLC here as we show the Pentair Learning Center uh, this is a self-paced do-it-yourself kind of uh, learning uh, uh, environment uh, it, it features live webinars that are pre-recorded like this one you might be listening to right now Pentier Pro Dealer Program. If you're an installer of our product, please go to www.pentierprodealer.com and uh, take advantage of the program. The thing I always say is a lot of these companies we deal with, uh, for example, the gas companies like Mobile, Shell, all of them, everyone offers reward programs. It's free money. Please take advantage of it. Take a look. Pentier Customer Access Portal. Uh, if you have questions, call 866 8803771. This gives you 24 7 access to product availability, pricing, order status, and more. Don't forget, we do still offer factory schools here in Delavan and also in Grand Island. We also are doing traveling schools coming up this next year. So be sure to take a look at our website or follow us on Facebook if you'd like. Now let's really get into what we're here to talk about today. We're talking about electricity. And electricity was a phenomenon that uh, Tesla experimented with quite a bit. Tesla and Edison actually both. Tesla was more AC, where uh, Edison was more DC. But basically, in a nutshell, things that have electrons that are easily excitable and transferable, that's what electricity is all about. So we're transferring uh, energy to make mechanical energy and then transfer that mechanical energy, for example, our pump, into working energy charging the water system for example. So let's take a look at how this works. And like I said, it's these electrons. Copper and metals for example, copper being one of them that has very easily excitable electrons that's affordable. Now what I mean by that is actually some of the best tra uh, conductors are actually uh, platinum uh, and, and gold. Gold is often used in the space industry because it doesn't tarnish and it's an extremely good conductor. It's also pretty pricey. That's why we often fall back on copper. Now, I just told you a little bit about Tesla and Edison. Edison, if he had his way, he would have went with DC power. And it's basically a chemical reaction where the electrons excite, go across the system, for example, to our light bulb, and create light and heat, and then go back into the battery, so to speak, the flow of electrons. Now, not that this is actually happening 100% accurately. Uh, I just want to give you a brief rundown on this. Now, one of the disadvantages of, of DC power is this. It doesn't transmit well over time. and er, It doesn't tr transmit well over, over distances, I should say, not time. Um, and, and that's where if Edison had his way and won the war of current, so to speak, uh, then you would see these little generator houses everywhere. For example, a cul-de-sac, you'd have, say, 15 homes, and then you'd have this brick building that had a generator and, and DC batteries in it. And if you can imagine the cost of that, and more importantly, the environmental detriment to that, can you imagine all those lead batteries everywhere? So it wasn't practical. So DC power has its advantages, and it is making a comeback. Don't get me wrong. For example, in variable frequency drives, we are actually putting out a DC voltage rather than an AC voltage, but we're faking an AC signal. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, we do have good uh, webinars on uh, variable frequency drives coming up. So 
We know that DC works. It's very portable. It's practical when you're camping for your flashlight, but it's not practical for powering uh, over distances. So what came out was Nikola Tesla and his alternating current, which Westinghouse uh, really invested in. And it premiered at the World's Fair. And AC power is, is practical to produce. And more importantly, it's practical to transmit long distances. One of the things about AC power you'll learn is that AC power um, has a inverse relationship with voltage versus amps. And because of this, we can take advantage and create very, very, very high voltages at low amperage and tra transmit this power very long distances. Now, before we get into this discussion, I want you to understand a lot of times when you're looking at electrical, it's, it's often described in terms of comparison to uh, water or ver vice versa, where, for example, voltage is as to pressure in our industry. Current or amps is to flow or gallon per minute and resistance is to friction loss. Now also understand that the larger the wire size or the larger the pipe the more amp or flow it can carry. The one thing I want to point out is that a lot of people forget in our industry when we go from three quarter to one inch to inch and a quarter the pipe size increases. When you're talking wire size the larger the number, actually the smaller the wire size. It's an inverse relationship there again. So a 14 gauge wire is smaller than a 10 versus a 6 versus a 2. Uh, but there is a lot of commonalities. This question I often get is what is better? Is solid wire better versus stranded? Well, look at the pictures here and, and you'll see a few things. First you don't see any solid wire um, because it's really not practical. And, and let's go over solid wire first. Um, solid wire is in fact often cheaper to produce. It's more compact in diameter and it also uh, is less prone to corrosion. Now let's then in, look at the stranded wire so you can understand why I'm saying this comparison. Uh, first of all if you can imagine a solid wire especially for example a double O wire a solid piece of copper, that would be very impractical to work with, especially in our industry, where often we're, we're bending and twisting and trying to maneuver this through a uh, different uh, conduit and down into the well and such. So, so stranded wire, though it's a little bit more and is a little bit wider in gauge for amp load carrying capability, it's more resilient to vibration and flexing, so it's easier to route. Uh, it's more costly to produce, don't get me wrong, I, I'm going to tell you that right up front. However, uh, the other disadvantage, and this is where your splicing becomes critical, is that understand that stranded wire is more susceptible to capillary action and corrosion. If you look at this picture, especially on the bottom, I like that picture because it, it demonstrates very neatly, you understand there's, there's tiny little spacing between each wire. Each of that stranding wire has this little tiny tunnel in it. And water will wick up in there. It's called capillary action. Um, and, and if you ever remember high school uh, chemistry or anything where you look, took the glass tubes and stretched them thin, and, and then uh, you could touch that tube to water and it would just vacuum up the uh, liquid. Um, that's capillary action. And if your splices are not good, Water will get into your splices or it breaks or nicks in the wire. And through wicking or capillary action, it will distribute that wire. And, and if you can imagine how much surface area there is for corrosion. Now, copper, I know that people will say, well, it doesn't corrode. It, it does. It patinas. And that patina increases the resistance and will eventually cause wire fail. So understand one thing here. I want to let you make sure you understand. Uh, is that we have to be really, really careful with our splices there uh, to try to keep that wicking action and that corrosion from happening. Or, yes, I know, the patina from happening. Now, how does AC work? Well, AC is magnetism. We're using a magnetic field to uh, energize or stimulate or excite, if you will, the electrons. Now, we know that a magnetic has a north and a south pole. We know that like poles... 
north to north or south to south will repel each other. And we know that's, that opposite poles attract, thus the same. So using this principle, we actually can create electricity. Tesla and playing with magnets and such. And, and it's funny where some of the, the more brilliant men, inventors, they always are tinkering or playing or observing. And he observed if you took a spool of wire and you spun it in a magnetic field that you would in fact generate an electrical current. Uh, and depending upon how fast you spun it would determine the hertz or the uh, number of cycles per second. He determined that he could then not only create electricity, but it would be broadcastable. It could be sent over long distances. And, and that's what really made AC attractive to people who are looking to invest in, in power supply. So when you're talking about power generation, we take some sort of fuel often, or uh, our friends to the north there, Canada, they use a lot of hydro. Uh, or, or dam powered and, and not to say we don't do it here in the US the Hoover Dam is a fine example of water power generation but we're using either fuel or some sort of, of water flow to create uh, a spin on the turbine the turbine spins and creates electricity and the power plant creates this at very 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 high voltages and it distributes it to a substation where it's then uh, uh, stabilized and then Basically, they, they put it in the right range that they need to put it to send it down these wires. And they send them down these high-voltage transmission uh, towers throughout like the interstate area. You might see them or, or throughout various parts of your state. And uh, understand, too, I want you to know those wires are not actually insulated. Uh, typically, they're, they're bare wire. And yes, you see birds on them all the time, but unless the bird can somehow cross and touch the other wires uh, or, ground them, or ground themselves. Uh, they're not affected by this voltage. Uh, you know, it's high voltage, very minimal amps, and, and, and they send it down to a substation. Now, I'll explain a little bit better too, but one of the things I mentioned before is when you take voltage and ramp it down, voltage goes down, amps must go up. So we go to another substation that does just that, brings the voltage down, and then puts it to a workable amp load and sends it out to the power lines where the various transformers then fine-tune and clean the voltage and send it into our homes and businesses and local industry uh, where it's usable. Now looking at this, when the power comes in, you're going to have two 115 volt lines. Now one of the things I want to stress is uh, when I talk to people about troubleshooting pumps, and they say, well, I measure this to ground, and I tell them, I don't care. And I don't. I don't care what you measure to ground. If you measure L1 to ground and L2 to ground, I don't care. It, 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 it's across the L1, L2 of the pump, T1, T2, for example, on a control like a pressure switch. But you want to measure across the line. So we have two 115 lines coming in that if you measure across properly, you measure 230 volt. Now... Then we have these 115 lines come in and they go to bus bars. You see that there's a gray bus bar and a black bus bar. And the best way I describe it is a two-cylinder engine with the cylinders firing opposite each other. Okay, And that's key to remember. Uh, I'll show you here in a later example where you can get in trouble if you don't pay attention to that. Then you're going to see a breaker, and that's a single post, single throw breaker with a black line going out to, say, uh, your outlet. You'll have there your power line. You'll have your neutral coming back from that power supply, and the neutral basically completes the circuit for the device and, and ensures proper grounding. Now, you'll also have a ground green wire, and you better have one. What the ground green wire does is protect the chassis, so to speak. Uh, what it is is uh, or, uh, protects the equipment uh, housing. Um, for example, a computer, you have... 115 possibly going into it. Now, I understand computer people are going to say, but Dan, you don't understand DC is powering your, your computer. I get that. But you have AC power typically coming in, which is then corrected, blah, 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 blah. But AC 115 comes in. The white protects that component, completes the circuit. If, however, something goes wrong, the power supply is leaking voltage to the frame, to protect you, the homeowner, or, or the consumer or the operator, the frame of the 
computer is grounded so that stray voltage that might leak can be taken to ground safely and keep you safe. So you have your neutral bar, which is both your ground and your neutral both connected to. Now understand, if you have a sub-panel, it is imperative, and it's per national code. I verified it in Canada, and I verified it here in the U.S. Per code in a sub-panel, you should have a ground bar, which is separate from the neutral bar, running all the way back to your main power supply. Then you should have a neutral bar, which is separate from your ground bar in the sub-panel, running all the way back to the main power supply. This is to ensure proper grounding and to keep stray capacitance off of the ground. Too often, and we all have seen it, I know I'll talk to in installers and in my classes, every time I'll have at least maybe two, three, if not a half a dozen, say, yep, we've seen subpanels, and they're grounded to the ding-dong water pipe. I don't like that. That causes floating grounds. Okay, I know I said ding dong, uh, but uh, you know it does. It, it frustrates me. You know, I'm trying to be polite here. Uh, you should not have that grounded to the water pipe. It creates what's called as a floating ground, um, and, and it can cause stray voltage to stay on the ground. Now, if you ever want to test the ground, uh, there's a few ways to do it. Uh, one, don't touch it. What you should do is pull out a low voltage detection or a voltage detection type pen. I'm sure you've seen these. Uh, you push a button, you put it anywhere near voltage, uh, or you turn it on, I should say, and, and anywhere you put it towards voltage, it will sound indicating the circuit's live. Now, a lot of electricians, me included, I'm not 100% sold on them. If in doubt, pull out your voltmeter. Your voltmeter, set it to voltage AC. If you touch ground to anything metal, for example, the screws on the uh, circuit panel, uh, the conduit, the conduit junction box where there's bare metal, uh, you, so you get a clean reading, you should not measure more than a half a volt AC. If you do, get an electrician involved, okay? Please don't, don't, don't get adventurous and get hurt. So when you're looking at grounds, in a main box, you should have a neutral bar, which contain both the ground and the neutral wires. In a sub-panel, you should have two separate bars. You'll have your, your bus bars. Don't confuse these with bus bars. You'll have bus bars. But you'll also have a neutral bar that is going to be wired all the way back to the main power supply and a ground bar that is wired all the way back to the main power supply. Uh, so you should have the two. Now, this is a standard household system uh, or light commercial system. Now, what you see here is a single post, single throw breaker. You have your neutral bar, which we just had a good discussion about. Now, that neutral bar, again, on the main power supply should be both the neutral and the ground. Sub panels, separate neutral bar, and a separate ground bar, which are not connected, each independently running their wires back to the main control panel the neutral bar earth ground make sure it's properly earth ground see the thing about the ground understand is that it's designed to get rid of stray capacitance stray voltage and displace it into the ground into the earth and um, if you have a is issue for example a sub panel and I'm harping on sub panels but often if you have an additional sub panel and, and you have now that sub-panel grounded to the water supply or maybe a secondary rod, you can often have two potentials and a voltage will hang out out there. It won't know where to go. It's looking to displace itself. And um, it, it kind of harkens back to, I, I remember my father explaining it to me, is that it's kind of like the starving donkey conundrum. That if you had a starving donkey... And they pick on donkeys because donkeys are supposedly dumb. And you have equal distantly uh, two bales of hay. That donkey would sit there and look to the left, look to the right at each bale of hay and have so much indecision that he would just starve to death. He wouldn't move. Electricity showing two potentials of a potential ground to the left and to the right won't know where to go properly and can often hang out on the ground. 
Uh, in one instance, I was at a job site where we actually measured 17 volts from a piece of equipment that was bleeding voltage was on the ground. Fortunately, no one touched it. We found this out with our meters. So I don't want to really beat you up too hard on grounding, but I want to make sure you understand. And when you see grounding issues, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, and I would hope no one would do this, I would never call you a coward or, 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 or make fun of you because you call an electrician. Ask for help, okay? Because these situations can be very tricky. Now you have your single bus bar, like I said, you have your, your black going down, your white coming back to create the uh, circuit, and that's your circuit. Now, this next image I want to talk about real quick. These are two single pole, single throw breakers that are tied together with, if you see the top one is pulling from the black bus bar, the bottom one is pulling from the gray bus bar. So it, we are capturing both sides of the 115 power. So we are making a 230 volt power. That if you measure across the two hots, L1, L2, they'll measure 230. I highly recommend not using these type of uh, uh, circuit setups because here's the thing. If one side pops and the other does not, you're still putting 115 down the line. Now, I know a lot of guys who say, oh, no, but these are tied together. And, and let's be honest, how many people have seen someone put in a nail that, and they bend the bottom so you can't pull the nail out and it's just flopping around inside the little set screws or little set holes for the two two breakers and it's feasible that there's so much give that one would pop and not the other now where this is applicable um some time ago when i was doing my electrical i i noticed that one of the women uh, in customer service she really wanted to get into the program and, and she was very curious and you know and, and i was like yeah that's fine you can you can you know hop in but i didn't understand why she was really you know aggressive and asked me to get into the program and it turned out she was trying to understand what happened at home uh, now a good example of a 230 volt system where often I'll find this is an electric dryer and the elements might be 230 but the actual timer and all the controls on top are 115 now in this case she and her husband uh, the element burnt out, and her husband's, well, that's pretty simple to replace. You know, I'm a, I'm a handyman, hon, I'll do it. He picked up the element. He asked his wife, could you make sure the breakers are off? Well, she looked, and there's two separate ones that weren't well tied together. Um, when she looked closer, she did see someone put in the good old nail in between the two. But she looked at it, and only the top one was marked, and that one looked popped. Now, she didn't realize they were tied together, and she told her husband everything is fine, and as luck would have it, he touched the timer and got a low shock. Now, he was fine, but she was trying to understand what happened, and as I explain here, this can be dangerous. A lot of local codes check with them. A lot of them now are cracking down on this and saying, no, you either have to tie them together properly with that little slide bar that goes across the two and now makes them rigid so they now are truly working in unison. Often that little slide bar will have a set screw in the center so they cannot be removed or slide out of place. Um, I'll be honest, when I used to do some work in the field, I would carry those in my pocket and I would just replace them without even asking or charging the customer because I did not want the liability, uh, especially for the pump work that, it, that we might be doing, I didn't want to assume the liability, so I would just replace it or repair it myself uh, if the code permitted. If the code didn't permit, then we talked to the homeowner and say we need to get a single throw double pole breaker. But these here, although it is proper, it can be a bit dangerous. The other word of advice, and I know everyone laughs when I say it, Never trust the homeowner to disconnect the power for the pump you're working on. If you can, you go in there and disconnect the power yourself. You should have a pump pump disconnect in the area, but some local codes allow you to use the main breaker panel as the disconnect. Um, I don't like that idea, but code is code. If the homeowner does not permit you in the home to turn it off, but they just say, I'll do it, Break out that meter, and before you touch anything, make sure all voltage is gone, including the ground. Okay, never neglect your ground. Remember, 
If you see more than about a half a volt on the ground, especially with the breaker off, be cautious. Okay? And like I said, you will measure 230 across these legs. So it's not that it's improper electrical hookup, it's improper safety hookup. Now, this is what we talked about. Uh, it's a single throw. See how there's only one switch? And uh, double pull, it covers both the black bus bar and the gray bus bar, creating a 230 volt circuit proper. More importantly, either one or both will properly trip when it needs to. So if you have a short on leg one, it pulls both leg one and leg two out of the circuit proper. Now this next one, I want you to think about it for a minute. This is one, and this is my example, why I do not care what you measure 115 to ground. I really don't. Because too often I get these guys that will say, oh, well, I measure the one side to ground and I get 115. I measure the other side to ground and I get 115. And anyone knows that 115 plus 115 is 230 volt. It's simple math. Well, I'll tell you, I've even had licensed electricians do it. They get a little sloppy. We all get rushed, you know, and, and they put in breakers and they're not paying close attention. If you notice, both breakers are pulling off the black bus bar. Now, I told you 115 to make 230. It's kind of like a two-cylinder engine. So you have... Uh, 115 on the gray bus bar and 115 on the black bus bar working opposite each other so the pistons are firing one two one two one two what we did here is we put both on the black bar and so they're both trying to fire the same at two so it's one does nothing both of them try to fire when it's the second count and basically what happens is the sine waves overlap and when they overlap they measure zero nothing the sine waves will cancel each other out. So that's what we're demonstrating there. So when you measure across L1 to L2 and you measure zero, then go ahead and measure to be safe, because I always want you to be safe, measure L1 to ground and L2 to ground. If you're showing 115 on each, you maybe at least know where to direct the electrician or how to correct the issue, okay? Now where I often see this is when I do my electrical work, I always start at the pump, L1, L2 measuring, I go back then to my control, beat a pressure switch, a timer, check the outgoing power, and then check the incoming power. It's not uncommon where you might see something miswired is, for example, at a disconnect switch uh, or possibly in a timer or a control of some sort. So that's where work your way back. Uh, start at the pump and then work your way back and try to see if it's the device. If you have to go into the main breaker panel, Always check your license to see if you're permitted to go in there. And I know the answer. I, I, I hear many of the guys laugh all the time. Oh, we just go in there all the time. Fine. But you're violating your license, uh, possibly, which could put you in liability. So we'll talk about that here at the end. Now, everyone knows that 230 is more efficient than 115. But here's the thing. Uh, there's a formula out there, and we'll discuss it, but it's, it's your voltage times your amps will give you watts. So if I have 115 and I have 14.8 amps, guess what? My amps times watts, 17 point, or 1,702. Well, let's look at 230. Remember when I told you how voltage can go up and amps will go down? It's an inverse relationship. If I double my voltage... I half my amperage. Now, just that there alone, anyone who knows math will tell you, the answer is going to be the same. So, 230 times 7.4 amps, 1702. There's really no difference between the two. However, big asterisk, there is a difference in the cost of copper. And the farther I have to run, if I can half my amp load, that means I can use a lighter gauge wire. I may not necessarily half my wire size by any means, but I can use a lighter gauge wire. And if I have to go 1,000 feet, I would much rather go 230 volt when I can because a lighter gauge wire can be used. So up front, to the homeowner, to the uh, small business owner, to the installer, it's cheaper to run lighter wire. We all know that. Okay, That is your savings. But long term, it's not more efficient. It comes to Ohm's law. 
Ohm's law says simply he had this little pie chart where P is power, I is amps or currents, or and E is voltage. And we can manipulate that. So amps is equal to power divided by volts, vice versa and such. So as you see here, we can manipulate this to find out all we need to know about the circuit. Now, near the bottom there, you see R is introduced, which is resistance. I want to make something very clear. I don't like that saying, it's not the volts that will kill you, it's the amperage. And that's a myth, because everyone forgets the R factor, the resistance. Depending upon how that current hits you, it all depends on what it's going to do to you. So depending upon how much voltage is going into your body, remember if resistance goes up, it can cause the amperage to go up. It can cause the amperage to then be high enough to hurt or even kill. So don't ever assume with voltage that, oh, don't worry, you know, that, that, that 60,000 volts, <clears throat> you know, won't hurt you. Like the birds, don't hurt the birds, right? Well, it's because they're, they're not creating enough resistance. So be careful. Always wear PPE, you know, your, your personal protective equipment. Make sure you know what you're doing. And if you're measuring an unknown voltage supply, turn off the pump or your, vo or your test point so there's no voltage. Hook up your meter, your voltage meter, to volts AC or DC. Most likely you're measuring AC and to the highest setting. Most uh, commercially sold meters will read up to 600 volts. So set it to 600 volts. Use alligator clips that slide over your uh, probe set so you can pin it without having to hold anything. Have your meter there with your hands free of it. Turn on the power supply. Take a look at the voltmeter and see what it's reading for voltage. Worst case, if for any reason it turns out that that voltage is higher than 600 volts, don't be touching the meter. That's why we have you set it to the side, because it can only hold someone's insulation, uh, protection. And, and if the voltage is high enough, it will smoke the meter, and you don't want to be touching it. So when in doubt, always use your per personal protective equipment, and be careful not to handle your meter if you're testing for voltage for the first time. If you turn it on, let's say we turn it on at 600 volts, and it tells you it's 232. Now... That's a good enough reading. If, for example, though, you have it set for 600 and you look at your meter and it's now reading four, uh, 14 volts. If you really want to, and not that you need to, because let's be honest, our, our work is like horseshoes and hand grenades. We don't have to know voltage right down to the tenth. But if you want to turn the power back off, set your meter to read 200 volts, turn it back on, then it might read 14.3 volts. And believe me, that 14.3 will not make any difference in how your pump really works. That's why I kind of make the point. I myself always leave my meter set for 600 volts in testing. I'm not worried about the decimal points. Now electrical is AC, and it is a cycle. It goes from zero to positive to zero to negative to zero again. That is one cycle, or one hertz. And what determines the rotation of the motor is the cycle of the sine wave. In the U.S., it's popular, and in Canada, they have 60 hertz. That means this cycle from zero to positive to zero to negative to zero, does, this goes through the cycle 60 times a second. 60 times 60 seconds, uh, which is or 60 seconds in a minute, gets us to 3,600 RPM revolutions per minute. Now, then you add in your slippage, and most motors are marked about 3450 RPM. That's where they all stem from, is the cycle of the electrical sine wave. Now, this is a very nice, clean uh, description of 230 volt. You see how you have two separate 115 sine waves working opposite, kind of like that two-cylinder engine. Okay, 115 is a single-cylinder engine. 215 or 230 is a two cylinder engine, and of course, three phase would be a three cylinder engine, so to speak. Now, this is a common question I get is how motors are wired. 
and most motors go out pre-wired that are dual voltage uh, above ground motors will be set for 230 volt and that is because when you put out 230 volt through a motor it goes through series it, 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 the windings are set up in series as opposed to in 115 the windings are connected parallel what I want you to understand is simply this if I put 115 into 230 volt because the windings are in series the best at best the motor will run half speed uh, at worst you'll probably trip the thermal overload and the motor will cycle very rapidly uh, the thermal overload will heat up quickly turn off and repeat the cycle until it gets hot enough and turns off for about 15-20 minutes before it resets again um, that's a little troubleshooting pointer uh, if you hook up a pump and it's getting constant voltage meaning that the pressure switch is not opening and closing because of hammer uh, water hammer or, or some reason the the control points are staying close and passing a solid voltage but the motor is going on and off very rapidly my guess is I would check the voltage and see if it's hooked up properly 230 or 115 volt now here's my point be very very careful you never put 230 into 115 because 230 when you put it into a parallel uh, connected winding creates heating coils and it lets the smoke out of the motor and as the old timers always told me and, and a lot of people tell me is you know that all motors run on smoke once you let the smoke out she's done how you let the smoke out number one way is because you put 230 into 115 so always check your motor make sure it's in fact dual voltage and make sure in fact it's wired either 230 or 115 do not assume <clears throat> now the other thing I want to point out real quick is that the voltage is the average under the sine wave it's all that area all those numbers measured and averaged so 115 will peak a little bit over 115 momentarily remember this is happening in 1 60th of a second so it's the average is what the uh, measurement is so kind of understand that now I also talked about Hertz and I want to tell you back in the day it wasn't uncommon that prior to standardization you would have a variety of Hertz so for example this trolley car might run as low as 17 Hertz back in the day because the lower the Hertz the more torque you have for the motor more more turning power and in, if you can imagine uh, higher torque would be desirable in that trolley car but if you look at the business behind the trolley car that business behind the trolley car if we put 17 volts into your residential home or business it would be like a strobe light effect so we can visually see 17 Hertz so a standard was created and like I said here in the US it's 50 I'm um, sorry it's 60 Hertz and uh, other places I'll show you in the next map it's not now I also want to put here a little tiny asterisk depending upon the industry for example the mining industry the mining industry because they do desire higher torque for certain equipment they might actually change the Hertz again but that's that's a special case that's different usually when we're talking standards we're talking general residential and commercial standards here looking at the map you'll see that most of well all of North America and a good portion of South America is 60 Hertz as well as parts of the Middle East uh, but a lot of the country or world I should say is 50 Hertz to 30 volt uh, Europe for example most of Africa now if you know your history and you're looking there close at Japan Japan's interesting where if you remember back after World War II there was the Marshall Plan uh, can you guess which side of the islands there that the Americans predominantly uh, were working on and that's the southern half uh, that's where that's 115 60 Hertz whereas the northern part of Japan is 50 Hertz so Japan's very unique in that way now we mentioned three phase uh, three phase like I say is that we have the sine waves offset by 120 degrees to make it a three cycle engine um, now understand that when you went from 115 to 230 volt how it half the amps going to three phase will not make one third the amps but reduces the amp load by about say 30 percent 
Um, and, and this is very advantage, uh, a very good advantage if you have irrigation projects or, or where electrical draw is for a long period of time. A lot of people will go to three-phase if the power is available, and that's a big asterisk there, if available. Uh, three-phase is not always readily available. So three-phase power uh, has the advantage of lowering the amp draw. Um, and so a lot of industry, of course, is three-phase. Uh, right here at the plant, at the Pantera plant where I'm sitting, you can bet we have a lot of three-phase power in this facility. It lowers the amp draw, uh, lets the motors run cooler, and also there's more torque because you have three windings firing, um, uh, and, and it gives the, the engine more torque, or the motor more torque. Uh, now, one thing I want to explain here real quick, too, because I've always been asked this usually right around here is when we're talking three-phase, people ask me, explain single-phase to me when, when you single-phase a motor. What does single-phase in a motor really mean? Um, a motor, I always, people laugh. I, I have these little silly sayings and such, but I always compare a, a motor to my faithful hunting dog. I have a little beagle named Carmel, uh, and when I'm upset at her, I call her stupid. Um which is, if you know beagles, they're, they're often stubborn. So, But Carmel is very faithful, very loyal, very loving, and Carmel will do anything to, to make sure you know, you're know you happy out there in the field. I think if I let her, would literally run herself to death uh, out there hunting, chasing rabbits for me. Now, what does this have to do with a motor? Well, a motor is kind of like Carmel. Uh, motors are stupid, and they're going to do whatever they can and whatever you ask of them, even if it means their own demise. So how do you single phase a three phase motor? The simple answer is, is that one of the three incoming sine waves or the incoming power supply lines, I should say, um, gets weak or drops out of the circuit. Say there's a lightning surge and one transformer dies. And if you don't have proper protection in the motor, that means the other two windings that are active try to pick up that amp load from the third winding that's no longer functioning or no longer has power. And so they start to pick it up and now they're trying to be a uh, basically a two-cylinder engine when they should be a three-cylinder engine. And those windings eventually get hot enough where they let out, guess what, yep, the smoke. They smoke, they flash, and the two windings will be burnt and the one good winding that really had no amp load to it will be nice and copper and shiny. So that's what they refer to as single phasing a motor, is that one of the phases either dropped out or became weak. Uh, the other two tried to supplement it, and they worked themselves to death. Um, so that's where motor protection becomes critical. Uh, that's where often a good uh, safety is a variable frequency drive for three-phase motors. Now, the other thing we want to talk about, and this leads to our discussion that we already talked about why a motor might single phase, it's because of the power supply sometimes. Now, true three phase will have uh, three transformers or three pots, one for each line. So L1, L2, L3 will come into the pot and go into the business or residence and will have a true balanced three phase power. Well, we do know that power companies are in the business of at least making enough money to stay in business. Um, even the cooperative ones, they got to make some money uh, because you don't grow unless you're making money. So I, I don't begrudge the power company from what they charge me because let's face it, they make my life very, very comfortable and easy. So to cut corners, what they often do is they do a Y or an open delta. Now, this might be because in a rural application, if you look at the power lines, sometimes the power lines only have two wires, period. Only two supply wires. So what they do is they have two transformers or two pots with L1 coming off the pot on the left, L3 coming off the pot on the right, and L2 is tied to both the left and the right pot trying to borrow from Peter and Paul to pay Mary there on the L2. Now, what often can happen is, depending upon the amp load and the draw, that third leg, L2, might be called a wild or dead man's leg. Um, because if, say, pot number two on the right were to fail, you'd have no voltage in L3, 
you'd have partial voltage in L2, and if the electrician or the pump professional is not careful and measuring voltage, making sure everything's dead, you grab L2 and there could still be partial voltage. Or you could have imbalanced voltage. You might have 230 volt on L2 or on L1. You might have 242 on L3. And L2, because there's a higher demand on L1, it's a little lower voltage. That voltage can vary, even to the point where it can vary when machinery is turned on or off. For example, at a farm, if you're running a 230 volt three phase um, elevator and you suddenly turn it off, that sudden drop in amperage would cause fluctuation. So that's where you have to look and, and be careful when you talk about what's referred to as a Y or an Alpen Delta three phase. That third leg, so to speak, is, is that wild leg or the, or, or the dead man's leg. Be cautious about it. Variable frequency drives, some of them can be very sensitive to that voltage change or differentiation, and it's called DC ripple effect, which can cause the DC output to, to vary. Uh, and so often they try to balance the incoming power, and if it gets too far out of balance, it will start to, to throw faults. This is just a nice demonstration showing the windings, very simplistic, uh, in the motor. Uh, so a three-phase power, you basically have three, three windings offset 120 degrees that fire in unison to create that three cylinder engine that we were kind of talking about earlier. Real quick, this is my voltage meter or detector. It's a very simple device that in this case, this one, you push the button, I put it anywhere near voltage, it will sound and flash indicating that voltage is present. Now, for what these cost, these are seven to ten dollars typically at your local hardware store. Is an investment worth having? If you're not convinced these are work well, uh, like I say, being an electrician, uh, studying to be an electrician, I should say, um, I admit freely, I never got my full licensing because uh, I got a wonderful job here at Pentair. That's the honest answer. Uh, opportunity came up here, and I, I shifted my my career. Uh, so what I'll tell you, if you don't trust this meter, break out your voltmeter. You should not measure more than a half a volt AC. Um, now, depending upon your local code, someone will say two volts. Um, I myself just preach half volt, um, but always check with your local authority. If you find voltage on ground, what do we do? Get help. There's nothing to be embarrassed to ask for help. Your voltmeters. Uh, and we will have a uh, webinar just on meters. Uh, a lot of people ask me what's better, is it this better, is this better, is analog better. It all depends upon what your work is. Here's the key. Whatever you buy, RTFM, read the factory manual. Read that manual from the factory that comes with your meter so you understand what all the different uh, uh, different uh, meters uh, outputs, the, the different ranges you're trying to explain to you, do you read the top range, the middle range, the bottom range uh, on that one on the left there or on the one here on the uh, right, the fluke, uh, it's telling me 4.7 what? Well that volts AC, uh, okay, and what is the little graph on the bottom telling me? So you got to read the manual. Real quick, I saved this for last. Um, I want to explain to you what the different categories are for electrical licensing. Um, and especially if you uh, come back and, and we talk uh, motor testing and such, I always like to go for CAT1. Uh, CAT1, basically when I go to my pump head and I turn the power supply off and I disconnect my wires and now I'm working from the disconnected wires down to the motor so there's no voltage and I'm doing my ohms test, that's cat one. That means that you're looking at maybe signal signaling devices like little uh, uh, relays uh, that are DC low voltage or in our case we're looking at an AC motor with no power and we're using an ohms meter so there's no uh, no risk of shock if you've disconnected everything and turned the power off properly. That's your cat one. Um, cat two, uh, now that's where most of the well driller and, and uh, pump installer licenses go to. And what that tells you is that you have a right to work with the electrical system to the point of your control. 
meaning that, for example, if there's a disconnect switch uh, out in your uh, pump house, you shouldn't be going beyond that. So you turn off the power supply there because you're authorized to do that. You're authorized to work on the pressure switch, but we are not authorized to go to the main distribution panel. That's CAT3. CAT3 is your electricians. That's your main distribution panel or circuit panel coming into the home or into the business. That's the junction boxes, the outlets. Electricians are licensed to, to work with that. Okay, That's where I warn people. When you see issues with the ground, it's probably from the main distribution panel. Okay, There is no, no macho man police out there that's looking for you. They say, oh, you, you were afraid to touch the main panel, so, so we're going to mock you. No. Don't be afraid to ask for help. And understand, especially if your license is CAT 2, you better not be going into the main junction panel, period. Now, CAT 4... Best way I describe it, you damn well better be working for the power company. You do not... Cat 4 is from the main junction panel all the way back to the power plant. We don't... Even licensed electricians will not go there. Won't go there. Okay? That's where you have no choice but to ask for help. Now, where this might come into play is, remember our three-phase power supply issue? And you have that dead man's leg or the wild leg? You have three-phase power, but you only see two transformers or two pots, for example, and, and the power is, is, is not proper. You have no choice but to call the power company. So work with them, be a good partner with them, and, and often they're more than willing to help you. Because let's be honest, they don't want to destroy equipment because they could be liable if they don't have proper power supply. And two, they make money by you using power. So why wouldn't they want to help you? So always have a good relationship with your power company, okay? Uh, remember, safety first. Uh, we've talked about this all the way through. And I'm going to emphasize this again. This webinar is in no way or means meant to train you to handle electricity 100%, okay? There's more training out there that you can get from your local power companies. Um, I know, for example, my local electric uh, supply house, where I get a lot of my stuff, they offer free... Uh, quarterly seminars uh, where they bring in people and they talk safety. So first and foremost, personal protective equipment, always use your PPE. Know what your meter's limits are and how to read them properly. Okay, And remember, a lot of these tests, the ohms test can be power off. You don't need to power on. When measuring voltage, always use some sort of alligator clip or something to keep your hands free of, as much as possible. Understand what your license permits. Okay, And remember, it's always okay to ask for help. Never feel that you have to go beyond. And I know the customer might get upset. Okay? I know the customer wants water back today. But you, you, you especially nowadays with litigation and so many lawyers out there, protect yourself by being safe and ask for help. Okay? And last but not least, always, always assume any wire, including the ground, has the potential of being live. Okay. I want to thank you very much for uh, listening in and for putting up with me. Um, you know, it, I do appreciate it. Uh, remember, these are always works in progress. Uh, so feel free there at the training.institute at pentier.com uh, to send me uh, emails of maybe other subjects you would like to hear more of. Um, or if there's something in the industry that's the hot topic of the day and you want more understanding, we're more than happy to research it and get some webinars out there for you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Dan. I'm from the Pentair Training Institute, and have a great day.